The next stop on the Studio Ghibli craft train is this Castle in the Sky diorama, complete with a tiny sculpted robot and heavy use of recycled garbage. Oh, hey everyone, welcome back to Studson Studio. This is episode two of my Ghibli craft series, so be sure to check out the Spirited Away bathhouse build I did last time. The series will culminate in something that combines all of the crafts into one that I am not so subtly alluding to with this thumbnail here. Be sure to subscribe so I can howl at you when it comes out. But until then, here's the castle in the sky diorama we'll be building. The scale is a bit too small for 28mm tabletop games this time, but it might make a nice doghouse in the sky. I don't want to spoil a 34 year old movie, but I prefer this version of the castle when it lets its hair down, so that's what we're going to build. This is a pretty good salad, but it makes an even better platform for a floating castle. To make the platform a bit wider, I'm going to salvage a plastic bowl from the recycle and then use a second plastic bowl to add some depth with some doorway details. I'm going to use some super glue to adhere these together, so let's put on our mask to avoid the hazardous fumes. I've seen a good number of Ghibli films, but I have to admit that I was today years old when I finally watched Castle in the Sky, but it was an interesting watching experience with the context of other Miyazaki films under my belt. As characters were introduced, I kept blurting out, same, wait, same, also same. Oh. Overall, I really liked the film, so it needed a place in this series. Next, I'm cutting some bricks from foam core board to place all around the perimeter of the castle with some hot glue. Then go grab your Kellogg Special K with real strawberries box to cut out a circular ring and this little structure asterisk to glue in place as support beams for the cardboard circle. I kind of miscalculated the height of my underlying support, so I'm sealing the edges and then using about this much force needed to leave a palm indent. To hide the hideous cardboard edge I just created and to add more detail, I'm covering the edge in more foam bricks. This isn't your average floppy cardboard tube from inside a paper towel roll. This is the delicious core from the inside of an aluminum foil roll. Look how it refuses to smush under the knife. I'll be using these to build several castle towers using air dry clay and a brick texture roller. This clay is prone to cracking, so I did a little test beforehand and yep, it cracked. In this case, the cracks are free weathering, but in most other cases, I hate this clay. Next, I'm rolling out some of this air dry cookie dough to make some bricks. With these texture rollers, clay is prone to stick in the cracks, so it's a good idea to lubricate the tube to prevent this from happening. I had some petroleum jelly on hand, so that's what I'm using to grease up the rod. Once you start rolling, you pretty much have to keep on rolling, otherwise the roller might not realign with the texture you've already imprinted in the clay. While the clay is still moist, I'm wrapping it around the cardboard tubes using some tacky glue to keep it in place as it dries. This will ensure a nice close seal between the clay and the cardboard. And then I'm closing the seam in the ugliest way possible, which is fine since you won't actually see it in the final build. Actually that's my craft rhyme of the day. If it's going to be hidden by another bit, then it's okay if it looks like bad. Okay, now we just need to wait for it to dry for... What? Three days? I can't wait that long. While we try accelerating the clay in the oven, I'm going to smear some modeling paste all over the castle platform to add a stone-like texture to the plastic and the foam. As always, be sure to stipple that goop to remove all of the brush strokes. I like to use the torn edge of a paper towel so I don't accidentally texture it with my lovely bounty paper towel design. Now we're ready for our roof. Kobe. If your ping pong balls are ripe enough, you should be able to crack these shells in half, otherwise an X-Acto knife works almost just as well. The plan here is to use one half of the ball as a dome, and then split the other half into six wedges to resemble segmented metal plates. And for some metal rivet details, I'm using these cute shimmering rhinestones, which I'll sadly paint over, even though I really like how they glitter. Wow, five towers fully bedazzled. Actually, it turned out to be a real pain to apply that many rhinestones, so I gave up and started using lumpy old glue dabs instead. This works, but it won't be quite as HD as the gems. If you're a past viewer, you might recognize what this doorway is made out of. Next, I'm going to try tweaking a recipe from Scratch Bashing's cookbook and making Spackle Soup's lesser known cousin, Modeling Paste Broth. This is just watered down modeling paste basically, which I'm doing to blend all of the hard edges together and add some texture, and then of course, gotta stipple that goop. While that dries, I'm going to use a pasta roller to flatten out some super sculpy clay to start making the tree and roots. It's hay! Careful, it's hot! 
Using a filet clay and a length of armature wire, I'm wrapping the clay around the wires and sealing it up as tight as I can until I have a bunch of these bendable roots. Then my texturing method was to use a wire brush to engrave some lines, followed by isopropyl alcohol to blend the messy bits together, and then finishing it up by giving each branch a spooky twist to turn it into gnarled barky. All of these fingers are going to be bunched together to become the network of roots that stick out the bottom of the castle. The castle will actually be resting on these roots, so the wire is important for adding some bone strength to the clay. In a way, these roots are actually foots. Rest in peace to this poor bush that died this summer. I'll be using this branch segment as a base structure for the tree. It doesn't have quite enough branches, so I'll be using a pin vise to drill some more holes, which I'll be mounting pieces of armature wire into, and then wrapping them in clay using the same method that I used to create the roots. Oh, my clay is way too dry and crumbly there, take two. After throwing it into the oven for a quick clay bake, it was time to make this weird mix of clay and bark look more unified. I'm dipping into the old Black Magic Craft jar to both seal and base coat the tree in one step with a mixture of Mod Podge and black paint. Same thing for the tree roots as well before we pass through this dark forest to discover the two browns we'll be using to paint them. We'll start with a modest brown coat. We don't want to go too heavy with this because a lot of those black details are working really nicely as shadow in the deep crevices. Then we'll finish it with a khaki dry brush, bone dry, just to bring out some of those bark details. Time to paint the castle platform using a rust red. Not because I think it's the best color here, but because it's the only one I have. I mean, I have black and white too, but I think rust red is a little bit better base for the orangey terracotta I'm going with for brushing over everything. Terracotta. Both the roots and the castle are far enough along in their painting process, so it's time for their union with some hot glue. The level here is being used for leveling purposes. Then I'm just filling in the rest of the gaps with more hot glue for extra strength. The roots coming out the bottom are looking pretty alright, but I think it would look a little bit spicier if there were some more roots breaking out the side of the castle and climbing down the platform to join the rest of the roots. For that I'm using my least favorite air dry clay and then sealing them in Mod Podge and black paint before they have a chance to crumble away. Hey, you know what's even stronger than Roots at supporting this castle? The two newest patrons that have joined in supporting this channel. Shout out to Party Crumbs and RT. If you're interested in supporting my crafting efforts and getting a shout out and more, peruse the offerings at patreon.com slash studio. It's a website. I really love making these videos and I couldn't do it without the support on Patreon. Thank I you. I appreciate you. Cool, back over to the castle towers, which I'm starting off with a light gray spray primer off camera before basing the roof in a plain old regular red. For the towers, I used an ivory, but you can use any off-white, any white except for regular white, because that would look way too clean for the ancient Laputa. Make sure those towers are safely secured with hot glue, then we're going to bring out a bib so we don't make a mess while we- I always love adding the dirt, since it's one of those steps where the model stops just looking like a toy, and instead a toy with soil. Right now there are a lot of solid colors and clean paint delineations, which is okay if that's the look you're going for. I want my Laputa to look ancient though, so these washes will help weather and blend everything together. And then after the wash, I'm finishing up with a quick pink dry brush on the top of the castle. And now my favorite part of the build, adding all of the green greens. This next part of the build was heavily aided by Tabletop Witchcraft's video on making fantasy trees, which I highly recommend. The first step here is to start cultivating mass with moss. I'm using hot glue to fill in most of the empty space until we've reached about 90% of our size goal. And then for the last 10% of the tree mass, I'm dabbing on a slightly watered down glue and crumbling on nugs of Woodland Scenic's clump foliage until all the moss is hidden. This green is tasting a little bland to my eyeballs, so I'm spritzing it with a watered down glue, then spicing it up with some yellow turf to give us a nice highlight to the top of the tree. I'm going to knock off the extra flock that didn't stick, and then save these tasty nuggets for later. Okay, I didn't want to have to bring out the airbrush because I know it's not an accessible tool for everyone, but it's just too fun. I'm using it to spray some green paint into the crevices and shadowy areas to act as a very fine moss growth. You could definitely achieve a similar effect using a green acrylic wash or lightly painting on some watered down acrylic paint, but I'm a fan of the airbrush because of the gradients I'm able to achieve. The green paint did knock down some of the highlights I had, so I'm going back in with an off-white dry brush to bring back some of those edges. 
The finishing Laputa details are the grass and the moss. The grass is a fine green turf sprinkled onto watered down glue, and the moss is a paste mixture of the same fine green turf and tacky glue, which I glopped all around the model in various places. This knot looks pretty light and gross right now, but the white glue dries clear, leaving behind a nice darker green. These bushes are the little nuggets that failed to stick to the tree earlier. They get another chance at life. I've been really digging this new addition to my crafting arsenal. It's this woodland scenic foliage that can be stretched apart to create creeping vines. After brushing on a little glue and carefully stretching the vine across two places, after brushing on a little glue and carefully stretching the vine across a few choice places, the flocking is complete. This pit, which no eyes will ever see, is getting drenched in hot glue, which should be enough to hold this big old tree in place. And that makes this diorama pretty much almost 100% done, but we're forgetting one little friend. It's called a robot. What's this fellow made of? Metal or ceramics? It's made of clay, Mark Hamill. For the robot friend's limbs, I'm rolling out clay snakes and segmenting them like so. Then I'm using tacky glue to adhere the body segments. I'm a novice when it comes to sculpting, but I think I can effectively pretend I'm not garbage by choosing subjects that are naturally sad and lumpy looking. This was pretty delicate work and I was afraid of accidentally crushing it while trying to connect the limbs to the body, so I used a soft tip silicone tool to gently coerce the pieces together. There's actually a tiny dab of glue holding on each limb. I didn't want to blend them too hard because in the movie it looks like they're held on by magic. And then after positioning this floppy little baby into a slightly slouchy sitting position, I gave it a quick bake and then started splotching it with brown and then a terracotta to add a little bit of a rust effect. It's looking too fully brown town at the moment, so I gave it a black wash to add some shading in the recesses, then went back in with a lighter terracotta to attempt to blend in some edge highlights on each segment. And of course, the little robot wouldn't be complete without a little dash of overgrowth seasoning. And I'm sorry, he's not available for adoption because his legs are getting glued down and he's already found his forever home. Oh, it's over. The end of this one really snuck up on me. The moral of this one is I am not fond of Crayola air dry clay. The second moral is thank you for watching. If you didn't like it, then dang. But if you did, very nice. Consider leaving a like, comment, and subscribe if you're not already. I kind of want to spoil what I'm making next time, but maybe you can suss it out on your own. If you do figure it out, try to just keep it among us, okay? Last and most importantly, thank you to all the patrons offering their fine support on Patreon and helping me make these videos at a nominally faster yet more joyful pace. Well, this video is over. My name is Studson. Thanks for watching and I'll see you next time.